Hello and welcome back to Animal Sciences 142. In today's lecture we're going to cover the material that's in Chapter 4 which is Tissues, the Living Communities. So to start out today's lecture we're going to talk about what tissues are, that is we're going to define tissues. We're also going to describe the structural and functional characteristics of each of the four different types of tissue. We're also going to briefly discuss the different types of glands that are produced by epithelial tissue and also describe the steps of tissue repair. So if you remember back to a couple lectures back when we had the organization of the human body, we said that a tissue is a group of similar cells that are specialized for a particular function or purpose and usually have a similar embryological origin. Okay, we're going to start out the lecture with some vocabulary that you'll need to know in order to understand the subsequent slides. Histology, first of all, is the study of tissues, whereas histopathology is the study of disease processes in tissues. And where this comes into play is that when we have a patient come to the veterinary clinic, uh, let's say with a suspected tumor or something like that, we'll often take a biopsy to see uh, whether or not that tissue is actually cancerous. A biopsy is just a way to remove a small piece of the tissue without killing the organism and being able to look at that through histological analysis. Now we're going to talk about at the end of the lecture the specific types of processes that we do in order to take something from a biopsy and finally take it all the way through till it's on a microscope slide. And this process is called microtechnique. And of course microscopy is the process we use to actually visualize the cells, tissues, or whatever else we're looking at on that specimen. So tissues can be classified into one of four major categories and these include epithelial tissue, connected tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. And we're going to talk about each of these tissue types in some detail. Now epithelium is a very unique type of tissue. Compared to the other three, it is the most cellular type of tissue. That is, it's composed mostly of cells. The other thing that makes it unique is that it is avascular. That means it has no blood supply. So all the nutrients that supply epithelial tissue actually come via diffusion uh, from the blood vessels that are underneath the epithelial tissue. And that's usually in the connective tissue. So sometimes the nutrients from the blood and from the body fluids have to diffuse quite a long way to get to these epithelial cells. The other thing you should know about epithelium is that it is very well innervated. And that's basically just a fancy term to mean it has a very good nerve supply. And so if you've ever cut yourself with a paper cut, you know that it doesn't bleed, but it can be very painful. And remember, the reason that it doesn't bleed is because we don't have any blood vessels in the epithelial layer. If that cut did bleed, it meant it's probably a deeper cut that goes deeper down into the connective tissues where we're going to find some blood vessels. The other thing about epithelium is that we can classify the surfaces of cells. For example, each epithelium has an apical surface, and that just means the top surface. On the outside of our body, the apical surface would be the surface that is exposed to the ear. On the other hand, the apical surface inside the body would be the surface that is exposed to a body cavity. And so we sometimes call this the luminal surface. In addition to having an apical or luminal surface, epithelia also have a basal surface. That's basically the bottom part of the epithelium that's sitting on connective tissue. And the connective tissue and epithelial tissue are always going to be separated by something called a basement membrane, which we'll talk about here in just a minute. 
So here's a schematic of a generalized type of epithelium. And this is actually going to be called a simple columnar epithelium, as we'll find out in a few slides. So if we can take a look, we see that it has an apical surface. That's the top part. And this would be the part that would be exposed to the external environment, or in the case of this epithelium, probably to the lumen of a digestive organ. And remember, the lumen was just a fancy word which meant internal opening. Now, in addition to having an apical surface, we also have a basal surface. The basal surface is the bottom layer of the cells, and that is the layer that sits on something called the basement membrane. The basement membrane is an acellular protein layer that is in part secreted by the epithelial tissue as well as the connective tissue that's underneath of it. And so one thing to memorize right now is there's always connective tissue under epithelial tissue. There's a few exceptions, but for the most part, any time you cut through epithelial tissue, the next thing underneath is going to be connective tissue. And in that connective tissue, we're typically going to have lots of blood vessels. So remember that the nutrients, the oxygen, everything that that epithelium needs is diffusing from the connective tissue up into the epithelial layer. So we classify epithelial tissue in three ways. The first of these ways is by the number of layers. Some epithelia are only one cell layer thick, in which case we say that they're simple. Now, simple epithelium tend to not be very good for protection, since they're only one cell layer thick, but they are good for the absorption or passage of gases. On the other hand, a stratified epithelium would be an epithelium that's made up of two or more layers. And in particular, the really thick epithelia, like we find in skin, are really good at resisting abrasion and protecting the underlying tissues as well. But they're not as good for absorption or secretion. The other way in which we classify epithelium is by the shape of the cells. And the cells can be classified as squamous, cuboidal, and columnar, and we're going to look at that in just a minute. And finally, we also classify epithelium by the presence of any surface specializations, such as cilia, uh, microvilli, etc. So we're going to look more at these three different types of ways to classify epithelia in the subsequent slides. Okay, we said before that one of the first ways that we classify epithelium is by the shape of the cells. And cell shape of epithelium can be divided into one of three categories. The first of these categories is squamous or squamous. And this just basically means flat or scale-like. And so squamous cells tend to be very, very flattened and very, very thin. And squamous cells can be found on the inside of blood vessels in a single layer or on the outside of a skin in multiple layers. Cuboidal cells, on the other hand, are cube-shaped, as the name implies. And we tend to find them in areas like the kidney, where we have some secretion and absorption going on. And so if we're identifying a cuboidal cell, theoretically it should be cube-shaped, but more often than that, it looks maybe circular or ovoid. But the big thing you want to watch for here is a nice circular nucleus that's in the middle of the cell. Okay, and finally, the third type of cell shape that we see in epithelia is the columnar cells. So these are tall, column-like cells that form the inside of the digestive tract and, again, often have a secretory function. So take a look at the columnar cells below. You can see that they're, in general, much taller than the cuboidal cells. But the more diagnostic feature you would notice is that the nucleus here is much more elliptical. It's not round, but it's sort of a jelly bean shape. And finally, the last way that we classify epithelia is by the presence of any type of surface specializations. And here we're talking about the apical surface, that is the top surface of the cells that are exposed to either air or to the inside of a body lumen. So sometimes we have cells that don't have any specializations, and we just say they're smooth. But other times we have something called microvilli. Now, microvilli are very, very tiny little hills that are in the uh, plasma membrane on the apical surface. And the purpose of these microvilli is to increase the surface area of that cell so that it will be better at secretion or absorption. So we tend to find them in areas where a lot of these processes are going on, for example, within the digestive tract. Another type of surface specialization is something called cilia. And we talked about cilia in the last chapter and basically just said these are little wave-like uh, appendages that help to move mucus and other substances over the surface of an epithelium. The last specialization, which we haven't talked about so far, is something called keratin. Keratin is just a waterproof protein that we find in areas of the body that we don't want to dry out. 
For example, we have it in the outer layer of the skin on our epithelium, and this keratin layer actually consists of oh, 15 or 20 layers of dead cells that have a lot of keratin in there. And again, the purpose of that keratin is to resist abrasion and also prevent the underlying tissues from drying out. So now we're going to look at some examples of each type of epithelium. And for each one of these examples, I'll show sort of the pictorial example on the left and an actual histological example on the right. And what you'll probably realize is they look very, very different. So starting out, our first sample is something called simple squamous epithelium. Now think about what that name means. First of all, simple at the beginning means that it's only one cell layer thick. And so simple epithelium, what were they good for? That's right, they're good for absorption, secretion, but because they're only one cell layer thick, it's easy for diffusion to move things across a simple squamous epithelium. Now squamous means that we have flat plate-like cells, again, that are very, very thin. And so this also helps us to produce an epithelium that's going to be very permeable to things like gases. And that's exactly the function of a simple squamous epithelium. Uh, one of the functions is that we find it in the lungs where it helps to absorb oxygen and that oxygen crosses the alveoli, which are simple squamous epithelium, and moves readily into the bloodstream. Our next type of epithelium is simple columnar epithelium. Again, the name simple means that we only have one cell layer thick, which means it's not going to be very good for protection, but it should be good for secretion or absorption or both. The columnar here means that we have the tall column-like cells, and how could we tell that they're column-like? That's right, they have that nice elliptical jelly bean nucleus. And so we tend to find simple columnar epithelia uh, in places like the digestive tract, and where we have nutrients that are moving across the GI tract uh, into the bloodstream, which is going to be beneath that uh, epithelial layer within the connective tissue. And sometimes we have ciliated columnar epithelium, and sometimes we have non-ciliated epithelium. So here's an actual picture of a simple columnar epithelium that I got out of the laboratory. So what we can see here is first you can notice we have a nice layer of simple columnar cells that are going from the lower left hand corner all the way up to the upper right hand corner. And that there's a space above that and then that space is called a lumen. And remember the lumen is just the open area through which food or other things is going to be flowing. And the apical surface of that epithelium is the part that is exposed to the lumen. In fact, most cases we would call that a luminal surface. And then beneath the cells we see the basal surface. The basal surface is just the bottom of the cells and the part that's sitting on the basement membrane. Our next epithelial sample is something called simple cuboidal epithelium. Again, simple meaning one cell layer. And the cuboidal meaning that we have nice circular to cube shaped cells. Again, they don't always look cube-shaped when you look through the microscope. Look at the picture at Reich. Those cells look more circular to me, or more oblong. But I can tell that they're cuboidal cells and not columnar cells because they have a nice round nucleus that's located approximately in the center of the cell. And so just like other simple epithelia, a simple cuboidal epithelium is going to be really good for absorption and secretion. And one area of the body where we tend to find this is within the kidney. Okay, here's another example of a simple cuboidal epithelium. Again, this one's probably from the kidneys. So what you can see that I've labeled here is the tubule lumen. You can see that there are three or four tubules that are traveling from the top of the screen to the bottom of the screen, and that the open space in those tubules is called the lumen. And lighting that lumen, we have a single layer of cuboidal epithelia. So we call that a simple cuboidal epithelium. And then that's sitting on a basement membrane. Now, what you can see here is that we have one basement membrane and then another tubule made up of simple cuboidal cells. So a lot of times we may not see hardly any connective tissue between two different epithelial layers, particularly if we're looking at an organ like the kidney, which is made up primarily of tubules composed of epithelial tissue. So now that we've gone through some examples of simple epithelia, let's take a look at some stratified epithelia. Now remember that stratified meant that we had more than one cell layer thick. So this is an example here of a stratified squamous epithelium. And stratified means, again, several layers. And squamous means that we have those flat plate-like cells on the top layer. Now this is something that you need to remember, is that oftentimes in a stratified epithelium, the bottom cells or basal cells might be a different shape than the top or apical cells. But we always classify the cell shape of that epithelium based on the cells that are on the top. 
So look at the picture at right. You can see that the bottom is cuboidal, but the top cells are more squamous or squamous. So we still call this a stratified squamous epithelium because it's the cells on the top that matter for classifying the cell shape. Now just like any other type of stratified epithelium, a stratified squamous epithelium gives us a lot more protection than a simple epithelium. In areas of the body where we tend to find this, well we find it in the rectum, we find it in the esophagus, the vagina, and also on the outside of the skin. Any place that's exposed to friction or we have the potential for desiccation or drying out, chances are it's going to be a stratified epithelium because that gives us more protection. Now we said earlier that epithelia could have various surface specializations and that one of these specializations was the presence of keratin. And keratin is a waterproof protein that also makes that cell layer very, very tough. And so we tend to find a keratinized epithelium in the skin, whereas the uh, upper 15 or 20 cell layers are actually dead cells of compacted keratin. So they make a nice waterproof covering for the skin and again prevents the underlying tissues from drying out and it also prevents pathogens from burrowing down into that layer and getting to the underlying tissues very easily. Now on the other hand, a non-keratinized epithelium would be found, for example, in the vagina or inside the body. This is still an area where we could have a fair amount of friction, but it's also an area that's very moist. And so that moisture is because we don't have any keratin or we have very little keratin in the surface of that epithelium. And so it keeps the epithelium wet and also helps to reduce friction. So in the previous slides we talked about simple epithelium, we talked about stratified epithelium, and now we're going to talk about something called pseudo-stratified epithelium. So think about what that word means. Pseudo means false, and so a pseudo-stratified epithelium is going to look like it's made up of several cell layers, but in reality it's not. And what we find with a pseudo-stratified epithelium is that the cells are merely just different heights, and some overlap each other, but all of them are attached to the basement membrane. And as long as we don't have cells growing on top of cells, we can't say that that cell layer is stratified. And so we call this cell layer a pseudostratified epithelium because it looks stratified, but it's really not. And we tend to find this type of epithelium lining the trachea. Now another thing you might notice about this epithelium is that it has these surface processes coming out of the apical surface of the cell and these are actually going to be cilia. And remember, cilia are actually modal little proteins that are moving mucus back and forth. Now, in addition to classifying a gland as endocrine or exocrine, we can also classify it based on the way in which it secretes its substrate. So take a look at the lower left-hand side of the screen, and we can see an example of a merocrine gland. A merocrine gland secretes its secretion simply by exocytosis. Uh, the cells are manufacturing the substance, and those little vesicles of pepsin uh, basically merge with the cell membrane and leave that cell through exocytosis.
And so American glands are not damaged in the process of the secretion. They can keep secreting and going on and on and on, and they don't have to repair themselves. On the other hand, if we take a look at an apocrine gland, it's called an apocrine gland or apocrine gland because the apical surface of the cell contains the secretions, and that whole apical surface will actually pinch off and become part of the secretion. Now, in this case, the cell can survive, but it has to regenerate part of itself because a large part of it was lost in the process of secretion. And finally, the last example here is something called a holocrine gland. In a holocrine gland, the whole epithelial cell ruptures and becomes part of the secretion. And so a good example of a holocrine gland would be within the sebaceous glands of the skin. So the glands that we looked at in the last slide were excrine glands and that they did have a duct, but they were multicellular excrine glands, that is made up of lots of different cells. We actually do have something that's a unicellular exocrine gland that is composed of only one cell, and that would be called our goblet cell. And goblet cells secrete mucus, and they tend to be found in great abundance within the digestive tract and also within the upper respiratory tract. And the purpose of this goblet cells is to secrete mucin. Uh, mucin is extruded onto the apical surface of the epithelium. It hydrates with water and makes a nice sticky uh, mucus coating that can be used to help trap pathogens, uh, particulate matter, and so on. And so it's the goblet cells that are responsible for making snot. Okay, so here's a nice photomicrograph of an epithelium that does contain some goblet cells. Now, first of all, let's look at this epithelium and figure out what it is. Well, we can see that the cells in there look columnar because they have nice elliptical nuclei, and they appear to be stacked on top of each other, but they're really not. Uh, each of those cells is actually attached to the basement membrane, so in this case it would be called a pseudostratified columnar epithelium. Now the other thing you should notice is that there's a nice furry layer uh, on top of the apical surface and that furriness is actually the cilia. And remember, the cilia are there to help disperse the mucus that is produced by our goblet cells. And so where are the goblet cells? We'll take a look at those nice clear bubbles that we see and those bubbles are accumulation of mucin and so the goblet cell is what's surrounding that. Okay, our next group of tissues are the connective tissues. Now, connective tissues, I should point out, are never going to be found on a body surface. They are always going to be found buried underneath an epithelial tissue. Now, unlike epithelium, some types of connective tissues, in fact, do have a good blood supply. For example, bone is a connective tissue, very good blood supply. On the other hand, other types of connective tissue, like cartilage or like tendons and ligaments, don't have a good blood supply. And so if they don't have a good blood supply, they tend to heal very, very slowly. Uh, the big thing that distinguishes connective tissues from any other tissue type is that it contains very few living cells. That is, the majority of the tissue is actually made up of non-cellular or acellular material, and we call this material the extracellular matrix. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Now, there's two different types of connective tissue. Our connective tissue proper, or what we call fibrous connective tissue, and then there's everything else uh, which we call specialized connective tissue. So in the last slide, we said that connective tissues are made up primarily of non-cellular material, which is true, but there are some cells in there. And we do need to talk about those cells because the cells are very important for helping to secrete and maintain the extracellular matrix. So here's the artist's rendition of what a connective tissue might look like. So we're just taking a look at the cells at this point. And here we see our fibroblasts, remember, that are actually secreting the fibers that are present. We have our plasma cells that are making antibodies and trying to keep us pathogen free. Our fat cells or adipocytes, which are giving us a little bit of insulation and energy storage. And also our macrophages, which are just there to gobble up any sort of cellular debris or bacteria that might get down in there.
Now the other thing that we have somewhere down there, oh there it is, is we have cells that produce histamine and these are our mast cells and this is important because when a tissue becomes infected or damaged through trauma one of the first signs of that damage is inflammation and inflammation causes redness and swelling and tenderness but it also helps to bring raw materials to the site of the injury so that we can help to start tissue repair. Okay, so now enough about cells. We already talked about all the cells that are in connective tissue. Now let's go talk about the matrix. No, not that type of matrix. The matrix I'm talking about here is the extracellular matrix. That is everything within a connective tissue that is not made up of living cells. And in most connective tissues, the matrix is made up of two things. It's made up of fibers, and it's also made of something called ground substance. Now ground substance can be sometimes more watery or more gel-like depending on the tissue that we're in. More importantly are the fibers. There's three different types of fibers that we're likely to find within the extracellular matrix or at least within fibrous connective tissues. Okay, back to the artist's rendition of a connective tissue, but now we're looking at the fibers. So take a look first at the collagen fiber. Here they show it as looking a little orange or beige-ish, but in truth they tend to be more white. The big thing about collagen fibers is they're very thick and very strong and a little bit stretchy, but not a lot. And so the collagen is what gives the skin and other areas of the body its strength. Our next fiber type you're going to see is going to be the elastic fibers. And those are the same color as the collagen fibers, but they tend to be more kinky or wavy. And so you can see how these could stretch out and uh, not break. And so they give us some elasticity or suppleness to the skin and other areas where we find lots of elastic fibers. And the third type of fiber, which we may or may not find, is going to be the reticular fiber. Again, reticular fibers are basically going to be little networks or scaffolds on which cells can sit. And we tend to find this in areas of the body where there's a lot of filtration going on, for example, in the lymph nodes. Okay, so now that we've learned about the two different parts of connective tissue, that is the cells and the extracellular matrix, we're going to go on to talk about the different types of connective tissue. Now we have fibrous connective tissue and also specialized connective tissue. We're going to start out first with the fibrous connective tissues. And oftentimes we call these connective tissue proper because they have all the components that connective tissue should. And so fibrous connective tissues can be divided into either loose or dense connective tissues. And we say this based on whether the fibers are densely packed or loosely packed. So here's something in biology that actually makes sense. And so there's three different examples of each of these categories. Our first example of a loose connective tissue is areolar connective tissue. Now areolar connective tissue is basically made up of loosely woven fibers and it surrounds organs and is found deep within the subcutaneous layer around skin and muscle. It also surrounds blood vessels. And so if you know anything about the word subcutaneous, you know that means below the skin. And so the subcutaneous layer is a layer beneath the skin that contains some fat cells but also lots of areolar connective tissue. And it's really, really good at absorbing and storing excess fluids. Now because the areolar tissue layer is very good at absorbing and storing fluids, we can actually give fluids to a patient if needed in the subcutaneous layer. And so if you have a cat or a dog, if you're a veterinarian, you can simply slip that needle down through the skin into the subcutaneous layer but not into the muscle and put you know, several milliliters of fluid in there. Our next type of loose connective tissue is adipose tissue. And adipose tissue, as you probably know, is fat tissue. The purpose of adipose tissue is, well, multifold. One, it does help us store a lot of extra calories. But the other function of adipocytes is to insulate areas of the body, you know, prevent us from becoming hypothermic, and also cushion internal organs. We tend to have a very nice capsule of fat around organs that we don't want to move or be jostled around. For example, we have a nice fat layer surrounding the kidneys that helps to hold them in place. Now most of the fat that we're going to talk about is white fat and its main reason for being there is to store energy or cushion. We also have a second type of fat called brown fat. Now brown fat helps to generate heat to maintain body temperature. And we tend to find this more in newborns or very, very small mammals that are more prone to uh, hypothermia. Okay, our last type of loose connective tissue is reticular tissue. 
and reticular tissue is found in the spleen and also within the lymph nodes. And in both these areas, the reticular tissue is basically made up of these interconnecting reticular fibers. And the purpose of this mesh network is to help in some way with the process of filtering. For example, one of the things that the spleen does is filter the blood and help to pull out worn out red blood cells. And the purpose of the lymph nodes, of course, is to filter the lymph. And so this mesh network helps with that filtration process, but also sitting in the mesh network, we have lots of white blood cells that are basically sitting there as sentinels watching for any type of pathogenic material that might come through. Okay, now let's go on to talk about the dense connective tissues. Dense connective tissues have very tightly packed fibers, and they can be divided into one of three categories. Dense regular, dense irregular, and elastic. So dense regular connective tissue consists of tightly packed parallel collagen fibers, and this tends to be found in areas like tendons and ligaments. Remember, a tendon connects muscle to bone, and a ligament connects bone to bone. And so it's important to point out that these areas are avascular, they don't have a good blood supply, and as a result, they don't tend to repair themselves very well when they're damaged. And so think about a tendon or a ligament. It's very, very strong as long as you pull that or stress it in the direction of the fibers. Now, for example, if you pull the patellar ligament in the direction of the fibers, it's very, very strong. But imagine somebody that's out playing football and somebody hits them from the side. Ow! what does that do to their knee? It can very easily rip and tear those fibers because any force that's coming perpendicular to uh, the direction of the fibers can break them very easily. Now our next type of connective tissue is dense irregular connective tissue where dense regular had nice parallel layers of fibers. Here we have thick fibers but the fibers are going every which direction and so this makes dense irregular very good at being stretched from any direction and it doesn't have that nice parallel fiber type. And so we tend to find dense irregular connective tissue around the joint capsules where it basically makes up part of the uh, capsule and synovial membrane and it also is found in the dermis of the skin. So here's a photomicrograph of the skin, and basically looking at what you saw on the last slide, where would you say the dense irregular connective tissue would be? Is it the red arrow, the blue arrow, or the green arrow? Well, if you said the green arrow, you're correct. The green arrow contains a lot of dense irregular fibrous connective tissue. You can see that it has nice thick fibers, but the fibers are oriented every which direction. It seems almost to be like an abstract painting. The other thing you should know about dense irregular connective tissue is that it usually has a very good blood supply. Now if you're wondering what the other layers are here, the blue arrow is actually pointing to a little bit of areolar connective tissue and finally the red arrow is pointing to some stratified squamous epithelial tissue. And we'll take a look at skin more in the next chapter on the integumentary system. All right, now we're going to shift gears and move on from our fibrous connective tissues to talk about our specialized connective tissues. Now we call these tissues specialized because they don't necessarily meet all the requirements of a normal fibrous connective tissue. Now most of them have an extracellular matrix, but that matrix doesn't always consist of protein fibers, at least visible fibers, and so we tend to call them specialized connective tissues. And these include things like cartilage, bone, and blood. Now cartilage is a connective tissue that is formed through a dense network of collagen fibers and also elastic fibers that are embedded in this chondroitin sulfate ground substance. Now the strength there is due to the fibers, whereas the resilience is due to this watery chondroitin sulfate. In fact, the majority of the volume of cartilage is actually made up of water. And the chondrocytes are the cells that occur within spaces in the matrix called lacunae. And lacunae are just little holes, and a chondrocyte is a cartilage cell. Now cartilages don't have a blood supply, that is there's no blood vessels within cartilage, but it may be surrounded by a dense connective tissue membrane called the perichondrium. Remember, peri means around or outside, and chondrium here means cartilage. And so the perichondrium might have some blood vessels, but there's definitely no blood vessels inside the cartilage itself. And there's also no innervation. And what that means for cartilage is that when it's damaged, it can take a long time to repair itself, and oftentimes it just won't repair itself. Now our first type of cartilage is hyaline cartilage. Hyaline cartilage is the most common and abundant type of cartilage in the body. We find it, for example, in the nose. We also find it in the sternum. And hyaline cartilage is composed of closely packed collagen fibers 
but we can't usually see the fibers. What we do see is sort of this glossy uh, glass looking material that has holes in it like Swiss cheese. And so the glass looking material that's sort of gray or bluish is the actual brown substance in the matrix, uh, whereas the holes or lacuni contain the living cartilage cells. And those are usually going to be called chondrocytes. And remember, there's no blood vessels within there, so the chondrocytes are getting their nutrients through diffusion of materials uh, from the perichondrium through the cartilage, and that takes time. The other type of cartilage we have is something called elastic cartilage. Elastic cartilage actually has visible fibers, and a lot of these fibers are elastin, which means they're stretchy. And so elastic cartilage is going to be a lot more flexible than, let's say, hyaline cartilage. So we tend to find it in areas, for example, in the ears that are undergoing a lot of stretching. We also find it uh, in the epiglottis and the larynx. Okay, a third type of cartilage is fibrocartilage, and fibrocartilage has a lot more visible fibers. That is, it's a mixture of white fibrous connective tissue and also our chondrocytes. And so it tends to be one of the strongest types of cartilage, but also have some resiliency to it. That is, it tends to give a little bit. And the one place that we find a lot of fibrocartilage is in the intervertebral discs. And this is where it serves as a shock absorber. So you're jumping around, moving from side to side. The purpose of these intervertebral discs is to prevent bone from crushing into bone. And so they act as miniature shock absorbers to prevent one vertebrae from colliding into another. Our next type of specialized connective tissue is bone. Now, bone has a matrix that is composed of inorganic calcium phosphate. And unlike cartilage, it is very well vascularized, which means it has a good blood supply. Now, as a result of having a good blood supply, it tends to heal very readily when it's broken. Now, within the bones themselves, we'll find canals that contain blood vessels called herversion canals. Also within the bone, we also have a very good nerve supply. And you obviously know this if you've ever broken a bone because, gosh darn it, it really hurts. Now, unlike cartilage cells, which had to absorb their nutrients through diffusion through surrounding tissues, uh, there are canals called canaliculi that help unite the central blood vessel within an osteon of bone with the outlying cells that are sitting in little lacunae. So just like in cartilage where we had cells that were sitting in little holes called lacunae, we have the same thing going on in bone. The difference is, is that there's sort of an irrigation canal going from these cells to the blood vessel where the nutrients are located. Now bone, of course, is a very important tissue in the body. And one of the things it does is to protect very delicate organs. Think about your brain. It's encased in a nice cranium of bone. The other thing is that it forms bones that can basically be fulcrums for movement. So think about your radius, your ulna, your humerus. They're all there to help you generate movement. Now your bone tissue is also a very important space for storing minerals, principally calcium, because calcium is needed for several different things in the body. It's needed for nerve impulses, it's needed for muscle contraction, and if you're like me and probably not getting enough calcium in your diet, your body basically can go to your bones and take a little calcium out of the bone bank. Now the other thing we should point out is that bone tissue can also be a very important site for blood cell formation. Within the epiphyses of our long bones, we have something called red bone marrow, and red bone marrow is responsible for generating red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, and so on. And so bone can be classified into one of two different types, spongy bone or compact bone. Now the bone that we looked at in the previous slide was compact bone. It sort of looks like the rings of a tree. It has this osteon with a nice central perversion canal where we have a blood vessel and this is what we find in the shafts of long bones whereas spongy bone is found in the ends of long bones so if you've ever sitting there and eaten a chicken wing and you bite through the end of the long bone you see that it's sort of sponge like you've just hit spongy bone okay pop quiz what kind of bone is this well if you said compact bone you're correct you can tell it's compact bone because we have these nice transverse sections that look like rings of a tree or tree trunks. In the middle of that tree, we can see a nice big opening called the Haversian Canal, and that's where our blood vessels and the nerves would be. And the outer lying areas where you see the little dark dots, those are the little lacunae where the little bone cells will live. And the bone cells in this case are called osteocytes. Okay, our last type of specialized connective tissue is blood, and blood is certainly probably the weirdest specialized connective tissue you're going to see. 
And one of the reasons I think it's so weird is that here the ground substance is primarily going to be liquid, and this liquid is called plasma. Now plasma is made up primarily of water and a little bit of dissolved protein. Unlike most other connective tissues, we don't have any fibers, visible or not, found within the blood unless it begins to clot. So what we do have is within the plasma we have several dissolved proteins that normally just remain soluble uh, within the plasma, but if a blood vessel is broken and we have blood loss, some of those soluble proteins can become insoluble and can therefore help to clot the broken blood vessel and prevent further blood loss. Now also in blood we find a lot of cells, and the cells that we find are erythrocytes, leukocytes, and thrombocytes. Erythrocytes, as you probably already know, are the red blood cells, and that's what erythros means, red, and the purpose of these red blood cells is to carry oxygen. The leukocytes are the white blood cells, and their purpose is to basically ward off any type of invaders in the body, and then we also have our thrombocytes. The thrombocytes are there to help assist with blood clotting should we uh, rupture a blood vessel. Our next type of tissue is called muscle tissue, and muscle tissue, of course, is a contractile tissue, and it's composed of interlacing actin and myosin fibers, and we tend to have three different types of muscle tissue in the body, skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, and also cardiac muscle. Okay, our first type of muscle, and probably the one you're most familiar with, is skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is the muscle that we find on our skeleton. When you go to weight lift at the gym, it's your skeletal muscle that you're trying to build up. And so skeletal muscle is made up of very long, large cells that contain hundreds and hundreds of nuclei and, of course, lots of mitochondria. Now, contraction of skeletal muscle is usually controlled through conscious efforts. That is, we say it's voluntary. You tell your biceps to contract, your biceps contracts. The other property of skeletal muscle is that it's striated. So here's a nice picture of a longitudinal section of skeletal muscle. First of all, we can tell it's skeletal muscle because we can see lots and lots of nuclei surrounding very, very long tubes, which are the actual muscle cells themselves. Now, previously we said that cells tend to be very, very small and microscopic, but that's not the case for skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle fibers or cells can be quite long, for example, several inches long. The other thing you can notice about it, if you squint and look very closely, is that it has perpendicular lines going through the muscle fibers. And so we say that skeletal muscle is striated. It has striations. And remember that skeletal muscle is under voluntary nervous control. The next muscle type is smooth muscle. As the name implies, we don't have any striations here. So none of the striations that we saw was skeletal muscle. Instead, the cells are very, very small and spindle-shaped, and they tend to be organized in a willy-nilly fashion. That is, we don't have parallel bundles of fibers like we saw with skeletal muscle. Now, unlike skeletal muscle, smooth muscle cannot be consciously controlled, and it tends to be found in areas of hollow organs, for example, within the walls of blood vessels, and also within the walls of GI or gastrointestinal organs. And within these organs, it helps with the process of peristalsis, which is just basically the movement of food through the digestive tract. So here's a nice slide of some smooth muscle tissue. What you're going to notice is that the fibers are oriented every which direction. I mean, to me, it looks very similar to dense irregular connective tissue, but I can tell it's not dense irregular because I see lots and lots of those little purple dots. And what are those purple dots? That's right, they're nuclei. And here, smooth muscle cells tend to usually only have one nucleus per piece. So we know that the smooth muscle cells must be a lot smaller than the regular striated skeletal muscle cells. Okay, and our last muscle type is cardiac muscle. If you've taken medical terminology or just watched TV, you know that cardiac means heart. And so cardiac muscle tends to be found only in the heart. Now, cardiac muscle is striated, just like skeletal muscle was, but the cells are very, very short, and they're connected to each other by something called intercalated discs. Now, these intercalated discs allow passage of molecules and electrical signals between cells, which is important because one of the things that cardiac muscle has that skeletal muscle doesn't is it has this autorhythmic potential. That is, some cells within the cardiac muscle can actually generate their own electrical impulses and cause that heart to contract. So here's a good picture of a longitudinal section of cardiac muscle. 
what you notice first of all is that each cell only has one, maybe two nuclei, and that some of these cells branch just like a tree branches. The other thing you'll notice is that on occasion you'll see these dark perpendicular lines that are the intercalated discs. These can be really hard to see in lab and usually we have to treat the tissue with a special stain to see it, but intercalated discs are only found in cardiac muscle and they allow the passage of electrical information from cell to cell, which is very important in order for the heart to contract rhythmically. The other thing that you might be able to notice if you squint very carefully at the screen is that cardiac muscle, like skeletal muscle, is striated. It has lots of perpendicular lines going through it, and we'll talk about the function of these lines later on when we get to the muscular system. Okay, our last major tissue type is nervous tissue. And as you're probably already aware, nervous tissue is found in the brain, spinal cord, and also the peripheral nerves. There's two different cells in nervous tissue, the neurons and also the neuroglial cells. Now the neurons are the cells that generate action potentials or nerve impulses, and the neuroglial cells are there to support or insulate the neurons. The neurons themselves have a few different parts. First off, we're going to look at the dendrites. The dendrites receive stimulation from adjacent neurons. So neurons talk to one another using both neurotransmitters as well as electrical activity. Now the input comes in the dendrites and goes to the cell body, and connected to the cell body is a long structure called the axon. The axon is basically an electrical cord that transmits nerve impulses away from the cell body and towards skeletal muscle cell, or it might be transmitting it towards another nerve cell. Now neurons are one of those exceptions to the fact that cells are usually small. Uh, because they have very long axons, neurons themselves can be several inches in length. So, and we'll talk more about neurons and neuroglial cells when we talk about the nervous system. Okay, we're going to finish up today's lecture by talking a little bit about tissue healing and repair. Because as a future veterinary technician or assistant, you're probably going to see an animal that's either been hit by a car or otherwise had some other type of traumatic injury which needs to be treated. And so the two major steps that go along with wound healing involve, one, inflammation, and two, actual tissue repair. So we're going to talk about each of these steps in some detail. First off, let's look at the process of inflammation. So imagine that an owner has come into the veterinary clinic and their dog has basically stepped on something and cut its paw pad open. The first process that's going to happen is we're going to have some bleeding. Now, the bleeding is going to elicit something called a vascular spasm where the blood vessels will initially contract to reduce the blood loss. After that happens, however, we will have a period of vasodilation. Now, vaso here just means vessel and dilation means to enlarge. And so when tissue is injured, the mast cells that live within that tissue will release histamine, and histamine causes inflammation and swelling. And this inflammation and swelling uh, does a couple things. One, it helps to rinse any potentially harmful material out of the wound, think bacteria and things like that. And it also helps to bring raw materials to the site of the injury so that we can have quicker repair. Now eventually what's going to happen is that the blood vessel that was severed during this injury, the blood in there will begin to clot through the action of fibrin, which is normally a soluble protein, and also our thrombocytes, our platelets. Now over the next few hours and days, the process of phagocytosis will go on. We have a couple different types of white blood cells, including neutrophils and monocytes, which are strongly phagocytotic. Basically, they move in and gobble up all the cellular debris and any type of bacteria that may be in that wound. And finally, the capillaries will begin to return to their normal size as the levels of heparin and histamine secreted by our mast cells uh, and basophils begins to decrease. And that ends the inflammatory process. So the purpose of inflammation was simply to rinse out the wound, bring raw materials there for the repair, and also to stop the bleeding. The second phase starts when inflammation is done, and that's the formation of granulation tissue and epithelialization. Granulation tissue is a type of connective tissue that helps to unite the two severed ends of the wound, particularly if the wound has a big gap in it. And so if you've seen granulation tissue, that's the stuff that, you know, if you ever peel off a scab and look underneath uh, and it's all pink and bumpy, that's granulation tissue. And so the granulation tissue consists of our fibroblasts that are weaving back and forth these collagen fibers. Now, at the same time when granulation is going on, we could have epithelialization going on. 
because underneath that scab that formed uh, during the hemostasis process, we have layers of epithelium that are moving between the edges of the cut wound. Unfortunately, the epithelial cells can only move so far. If the distance is too wide, then we're going to have something happen called second intention healing. So as your book says, wound healing can be classified as either first intention or second intention. Now first intention healing is probably the most desirable because in this case we have the edges of the wound held together in close proximity to allow the epithelial tissue to bridge the gap at the same time that the connective tissue is bridging the gap. And so with first intention healing, we usually end up with a very minor scar, if any scarring whatsoever. Now sometimes we have first intention healing just because it's a very minor injury to begin with, or because we've had a fairly large injury, but through the process of suturing, have been able to bring those two edges of the wound close enough together that we can have healing by first intention. Now the opposite of this process is something called second intention healing, or healing by second intention. Uh, this is what happens if an animal tends to injure itself, uh, let's say out in the barnyard and you're not quick enough to catch it, that we get a very large wound, uh, you know, imagine in this case a horse has cut himself on a fence and you weren't there to observe it and so it begins to heal over the next successive days but because there's such a great distance across that wound, uh, the epithelialization is not able to happen at the same rate as the granulation tissue. And so the granulation tissue does help to heal the wound but it actually overgrows the wound and makes a very obvious scar. So we call this second intention healing. Now sometimes in some textbooks you'll actually read about something called healing by third intention and this is basically just called delayed primary closure. In some circumstances you'll have an animal brought into the veterinary clinic uh, that has a very fresh wound but a wound which is also very dirty. Imagine a dog that's been hit by a car and dragged underneath that car for some ways. We can't close that wound up right away oftentimes because that will just separate and so they will leave the wound open sometimes, irrigate it, rinse it, let it drain and then after that inflammation has subsided they'll go back and close it again and let it heal via first intention healing. You've now reached the end of the lecture on tissues. There will be a few short questions uh, after this lecture just to assess your knowledge of the subject matter. As normal, uh, these questions will not become part of your grade, but if you score less than 70%, I do suggest you go back and review this lecture again before going on to take this week's Lalima quiz.